history of Deccan and South India focused on the conflict between two geographic regions. One was the Western Deccan and the other was the Tamilakam region. Now by Western Deccan we mean the region which was located in the coastal plateau area and which was uh, enclosed by the hills and Tamilakam or Tamilaham means the region to the south of Chennai. This region was a very fertile region. Now during the early medieval period that is around 600 CE what we find is that the small chief ships or small kingdoms were given away to larger kingdoms and in the court also we find uh, that during in the peninsular portion of India that we have of shifting between the local cultures and the uh, input of the Sanskritic culture. So there is an interface between the local culture and the Sanskritic culture in the courts of the peninsular India. Now when we look at the political history or the political formation of the region, we find that it is marked by conflicts between mainly two ruling houses. One was the Chalukyas of Badami or Batapi which is nearer to Bijapur area in North Karnataka and the other is the Pallavas of Tamil Nadu. They were actually located in the Tondai Mandalam area. Now apart from the Chalukyas and the Pallavas, we have another party or another player who played an important role in the struggle between these two major powers. They were the Pandyas who were settled in the Madurai region. <laughs> As regards the Chalukyas, the main seat of power was Batapi or Badami and they also had access to the adjacent regions of Aihol and moved in the northern part of the Karnataka and also to the areas where the Vakatakas were ruling uh, during the earlier part. Moreover, we find from the Aihol inscription that the Chalukyas were also controlling areas of uh, the Konkan coast which were very important for trading network. For example, in the inscription we have the Chalukyan conquest of Rebati Deva, which was the Goa region. We have reference to the conquest of Elephanta which we, we all know is near Bombay. So the control of these regions actually gave them a much larger control over the trading network of the Konkan coast. Now the first ruler of the Chalukya dynasty as gleaned from the Aihol inscription was Pulakeshin I. The term Pulakeshin means a lion who is very 
powerful, a big lion or a very powerful lion. Now, after that, we find that Pulokeshin on his accession to the throne, they were the feudatories of the Kadambas. So, they broke away from the Kadamba rule and then held a firm footing in the Karnataka region. So, on his accession, he fortified the city of Vatapi and became the ruler of Vatapi Pura or the city of Vatapi. He was succeeded by his son, Kirti Varman I, who in the inscription it is said that drove away the Kadambas of Vanavasi, the Mauryas of Konkan and the Nalas. Now, these Nalas were ruling in the Chhattisgarh area of present day India. So, having controlled the regions of the Nalas, the Mauryas, and the Kadambas, we find that the Chalukyas had a firm footing in western Deccan. <laughs> Kirtivarman was succeeded for a brief period by his brother Mongolesha because his son Pulokeshin was a minor and later on Pulokeshin had to fight his way to get the throne of the Chalukyas. He had to fight with his uncle Mongolesha. Now on his accession to the throne, Pulokeshin II embarked on a series of conquest and within this series of conquest, the first and the primary importance was those of the encounters with the Pallavas. Now, from the inscriptions, we learn that Pulakeshin II, immediately after his accession to the throne and after his conquest of Eastern Deccan, he established two viceregal houses of the Chalukyas. One was in southern Gujarat and the other was in the Vengi region, present day Andhra Pradesh region. So, we have the Lata Chalukyas, that is, uh, Lata was the country of Gujarat, and we have the Eastern Chalukyas of Vengi. The fact remains that after establishing a viceregal house in the Andhra region, Pulakeshin further wanted to go downwards into the southern region. And from the inscription, we learn that he defeated the Vishnu Kundins who were ruling at that time in the Andhra region and, succumb and the Vishnu Kundins actually succumbed to his power. <laughs> Now, when we look at the scenario of the Pallavas, we find that the Pallava ruler was Mahendravarman I, who was ruling in the northern part of the Tamil Nadu region, that is, which is known in history as the Tondai Mandalam region. Now, they were also moving further up to have some control over the Andhra region. Immediately after the conflict or after defeating Vishnu Kundin, Pulakeshin main thrust was conquering the Pallava region. Mahendravarman was a genius. He was genius at war and he was also a very good literateur because we know that he was the author of three texts like Matta Vilasa, Vichitra Chitta and Gunavara. At the same time, he was very good at war. So, when Pulakeshin embarked upon the conquest of the Pallava domain, Mahendravarman first tried to give him a good fight. But unfortunately, Pulakeshin defeated the Pallava army and Mahendravarman had to take refuge within the city walls of Kanchipuram. Now, after this conquest, Pulakeshin went back with a design to come back again. 
and we know that after a few years Pulakeshin again embarked on a conquest of the Pallava country now with a view to enter the capital city of Kanchipuram. <laughs> In the meantime, Mahendrabarman had expired. His reign period can be said to be between 590 to 630 CE and his son Narasinghavarman succeeded him. Narasinghavarman's reign period extended from 630 to 668. He was also a very able ruler. So he gave a tough fight to Pulakeshin and finally Pulakeshin could not enter the city of Kanchipuram. On the other hand, we know that there were different phases of war and in one of the warfare in the battle which is known in history as the Battle of Manimangala, which was just 20 miles east of Kanchipuram, the Chalukya army was defeated. The Chalukya army retreated to Badami, but Narasinghavarman was bent on attacking the Chalukyas and so he moved with his full force to the Chalukyan capital, Batapi. There he destroyed Batapi, the Chalukyan army was totally defeated and perhaps Pulakeshin fell in this warfare. He died actually during this war with Narasinghavarman. Narasinghavarman took the title of Batapi Konda, which means the destroyer of Batapi. After the death of Pulakeshin, the Chalukya kingdom faced a challenge because immediately after his death, the feudatories declared themselves independent and there was also vying for power among the sons of Pulakeshin II. But finally, one of Pulakeshin's son Vikramaditya, he with the help of his grandfather, the Ganga Kim Durvinita could sit on the throne. He was very successful in contending the feudatories. They were all diminished and he also could successfully take care of his brothers who were vying for this throne. Thus, the Pallava ruler Narasinghavarman had to leave the Chalukya country on the accession of Vikramaditya and the Chalukya domain remained united. During this conflict or during the years of this conflict, we see that one of the brothers of Vikramaditya, Jayasimha Varman, he helped him throughout for uh, with much of armies and support. Now, Vikramaditya rewarded him by giving him the viceroyalty of the latter region. So, Jayasimha Varman was now placed on the throne of southern Gujarat and that frontier was secured for Vikramaditya. He now turned his focus towards the Pallavas. He could not forget the defeat that was inflicted upon by Narasimha Varman on his father and the capture of Vatapipura by him and therefore he embarked on a war along with his grandfather, the Ganga king Durvinita. Here we have to remember that in the political scenario, these feudatories played a very important role. And we see that sometimes they supported the king who was their own ru ruler or sometimes they went against that king and supported the other ruler. So their role cannot be undermined 
when we study the political history of the peninsula. Another dynasty which played a serious role was the Pandyas. Now the Pandyas were natural ally of the Chalukyas because if you look at the territory of the Pandyas, they were looking, uh, ruling in the southern part of Tamil Nadu. The Pandya ruler was Maravarman and he was trying to move further north and capture the Pallava territory. So naturally when the Chalukyas were fighting with the Pallavas, the Pandyas became an ally of the Chalukya ruler Vikramaditya II. Narasimhavarman expired in 668 and he was succeeded for a very brief period by his son Mahendravarman II. But within this brief period, Mahendravarman II encountered a kind of conflict between a uh, conflict with Vikramaditya. But after Mahendravarman II, his son Parameshwara Varman I ascended the throne. Vikramaditya led a series of campaign against the Kanchi ruler. It was practically with the help of Durvinita, the Ganga ruler, as mentioned earlier, he could lay siege on the capital of the Pallava domain. Parameshwara Varman fled away and he was resting in exile in a neighboring place and there he actually gathered army, he raised army from around the feudatories and the military persons which who were settled in the hills around and therefore with a strong army Parameshwar Varman attacked the Chalukyas. In the meantime, Vikramaditya settled in Urayur region, which is nearer to the Kanchi capital. Paramavshara Varman laid siege on Urayur. There was a strong battle in Urayur and Vikramaditya had to move away to the Chalukya territory. <laughs> Vikramaditya was succeeded by Vinayaditya and during his rule we do not have any information regarding the conflict. So it was a tenure of peace and harmony for both the groups. But after that he was succeeded by Vikramaditya II who again started the legacy of this conflict between the two powers. Uh, the conflict between the Pallavas and the Chalukyas was again renewed. But before that, what happened is that we find that there was this threat of Arab invasion from the Sindh area. The Arabs had already settled in the Sindh area and they were now trying to move further down and control the coastal areas. Of course, because of the trading potential of these areas. During this conflict with the Arabs, the latter house, the latter Chalukyas, they played a very decisive role. We find that the ruler of the latter Chalukya house, Pulokeshin, defeated the Arabs and therefore secured the condition of the mainland Chalukya house. Vikramaditya became very happy and he conferred on Pulokeshin the title Avani Janasraya, which means the refuge of the world. He then ventured upon, along with the prince of the Ganga family, Eriyappa, and the grandfather, Durvinata, to the Pallava territory. The Pallava ruler at that time was also Parameshwar Varman, whom we have encountered earlier. Parameshwar Varman thought that he could give a strong fight to the Chalukyas but unfortunately he could not stand the battle and he was killed by the Ganga king Sri Purusha 
in a battle in Viland near the Kanchipuram. <laughs> there was again a turmoil in the Pallava family regarding succession. He died without any successor and therefore Nandivarman II from a collateral branch was brought in by the Council of Ministers with the approval of the College of Priests and he became the ruler of the Pallava kingdom. During this fight, with Parameshra Varman, we find that the Ganga king Durvinita, he actually snatched away the umbrella of the Pallava family along with huge amount of booties and jewels that belong to the Pallavas. It is important to mention here that the Pallavas were supposed to be very rich and therefore the Pallava dynasty was always under attack from different power groups. One reason was that the location of the territory. And we have instances from the inscriptions that they actually used the forest land into cultivable land. So there was a rich agrarian base along with it we had timbers and elephants and therefore the Pallava territory was a coveted zone for anyone who was coming from the north of the Tungabhadra. Now with the accession of Nandivarman II who was not very old at that time when he became the king there was a kind of turmoil but ultimately he could manage this with all his feudatories and fight back Vikramaditya II. What is interesting here is that when Vikramaditya II seized Kanchi, he actually did not destroy Kanchipuram. We find that he built many temples, he gave heaps of gold to the that had been taken by the Chalukyas as a booty and were given to the people, in fact, as if he were trying to, get, uh, drying, uh, trying to drive away the disgrace that had fallen on the Chalukya family with the capture of Vatapi by Narasimha Varman II. After besieging Kanchipuram and staying there for some time, the Chalukyan prince returned to the Chalukya territory. He then later on sent his son Kirtivarman II to fight again with the Pallavas knowing that Nandivarman II was not in a very secure position owing to his age. So when Kirtivarman attacked the Pallava territory, Nandivarman had to flee away. But later on with the help of Udayachandra who was a feudatory of Nandivarman and who always fought from the Pallava side, he defeated Durvinita, the Ganga ruler, and took back the jewel which was there in the necklace of the Pallava dynasty. It was a very famous necklace and the gem was known as Ugradaya. <laughs> Kittivarman was the last ruler of the Chalukya line and he was displaced by the Chalukyan feudatory, Rash, the Rashrukutas. The Rashkuta dynasty was founded by 
Donti Durgo, who was ruling in the area around Mahi, Narmada and these regions. So now what happened is that with the weakening of the position of the Chalukyan monarch, Danti Durga declared himself independent and he tried to capture the Pallava territory as well. So he set out on an attack to the Pallava territory and the Pallava ruler Nandivarman II gave him a hard fight but gradually we find that Nandivarman agreed to marry the daughter of Donti Durga whose name was Reva. Now with this matrimonial alliance, Donti Durga started supporting the Pallava ruler. In the meantime, by around 6, 753-54, we find that Donti Durga finally defeated the Chalukyan monarch Kittivarman and became the ruler of the Chalukyan territory and established the new house of the Rashtrakutas. We have referred to earlier of another dynasty, that of the Pandyas, who were also vying for the Pallava territory and who were the natural ally of the Chalukyas. Now, with Danti Durga's support, Nandivarman was in a position to fight the Pandyas, and we find that when Nandivarman Pallava Malla tried to have a confederacy of rulers against the Pandyas, and there was continuous fighting between the two groups. So in that confederacy, one group was the Kongu, but finally or unfortunately we can say that this confederacy did not stick to each other and the Pandya king was able to defeat the Kongu ruler and the Kongu kingdom came within the Pandya territory. The Pandya expanded towards the north. Unfortunately, the Chalukyas quitted a hundred years earlier. The Pallavas could stay back for another hundred years. And finally, the Pallava ruler was defeated by Aditya I, the Chola ruler, and the entire Pallava kingdom came within the Chola territory. In conclusion, we may say that there was a set pattern of the rivalry between the basically the two houses. And the pattern was that the powers were always trying to control the rivers and to control the Raichur Doab region, which was actually the rice bowl of the region. When we look at the history of this peninsula and far south, we find that even after the Chaluka Pallava rivalry, the river Tungabhadra continued to be a boundary for the powers to the north of the Durgabhadra and the powers to the south of the Tungabhadra. And thus, we have confrontation between the Chalukyas and the, Rashtru, the Chalukyas and the Pallavas, the Rashtrakutas and the Cholas, the Cholas and the Western Chalukyas. And this continued for ages in spite of any kind of dynastic changes or any kind of dynastic upheavals. Thank <laughs> you.